And I just thank the Lord for this church and for your love for Israel. But it's, it's more than standing with Israel, it's standing with God. Because if you don't stand with Israel, you don't stand with God, period, period. Because God said it's the apple of his eye. And the last nation standing, by the way, is not America, it's Israel. At the end time, all nations of the world will be destroyed, but Israel will stand. And we'll have our new Jerusalem because of the blood of Yeshua. And we'll stand together in the land that God has given to us all. Amen. And uh, I just thank the Lord for uh, Christian believers around the world that support us and stand with us. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's not a dilemma. It, it's, it's a tragedy. Uh, a young man from my congregation was on his way to Israel on October 6th, and he was on the airplane on Turkish Airlines from Houston to Istanbul on to Israel. All of a sudden, as they were in the air, he noticed that all of the Muslims began to celebrate. They were clapping their hands, they were dancing, and he couldn't understand what in the world they are doing. He said, this must be one of their celebrations or something going home to uh, Istanbul. And uh, he, so he turned on the news, and there they were. They were invading Israel, killing our babies, slaughtering the old, beating the people. We still were like uh, almost 300 days in, in captivity by the Hamas. And uh, it, we don't see the news of the thousands of rockets that Iran has been sending. I have pictures of the, of the duds that got these intercontinental ballistic missiles. They're laying on their side at the Dead Sea, non exploded. They just, God put them out. And our Navy helped in a different thing. But, uh, you know, the Muslim people are born with this song. It says, destroy the Jews from the river to the sea, from the Euphrates into the great sea. Every morning, nursing children, they continue in their school, they write the books how to kill a child, how to cut off a baby's head, all these things. They have dolls, they have demonstrations. You don't know about all these things, you know? And our government keeps on giving to Iran and to this work. And one day, God, if not now, God will judge this nation because of this. And uh, I, I'm, I believe with all of my heart that he already is. Yes. We're in the birth pains. We're past the birth pains. We're starting into the delivery process. We're going from the, the actual birth pains that the Lord Yeshua talked to us about in Matthew 24. We're gone beyond the times of birth pain. If you're still waiting for the birth pains, I'm telling you, they're already here. Yes. They've already been here. Daniel is already being fulfilled. The abomination of desolation, all the things that we're seeing that we watch on the news and many of us stand for uh, marriages of be between a man and a woman. A man and a woman produce children, not Jill and Joel. You know, it is God's plan. Ron and Jill, you know, married together. And, and all of these same sex marriages and all these things and all this stuff that are penetrating our society, our schools, and everywhere we go. Listen to me. What God said then, He means. Today. Yes. Amen. He hasn't changed one bit Amen. of script in the word. What he said then, he still means today. Yes. And that's good news for us. Yes. Because there's hope for us. Amen. He, what he said about our healing, what he said about our salvation, what he said about you know our children, what he said about our homes being saved, everything that God has spoken, he will bring to pass. There's not one word that God has spoken that will return void. It might not be happening right now for you. It might not be happening just at this time in your life, but what God spoke, it will happen. What God said about you and your family, it shall come to pass. What God said about you as an individual, Jill, uh, Rachel, children took my arm and she said, honey, there are lonely people. Jill's book on the divine woo was written during the time of her ministering the death of her husband. I was married 61 years and I took care of Dolly for decades of time. Jill was married over 40 years and took decades of time to take care of her husband. Somehow God put us together in, in December and uh, we just 
fell in love, I guess, you know, and got married February 4th. That's a quickie, right? <laughs> but we were willing to wait till June, but evidently God wasn't. But uh, because we did, we, we courted, we courted purely. We had chaperones, just like teenagers would have chaperones in the buggies. I mean, we had chaperones. We couldn't kiss more than six seconds. We couldn't hug each other. We couldn't hold each other. We couldn't be alone in the same building. We never in, uh, in her apartment, never in her condo. Ne we couldn't do it. it but we had chaperones that, that uh, were, were with us. And by the way, February 4th, we fired all the chaperones. <laughs> And it was on. <laughs> Thank you again for your support, church. Thank you for your support for us and what we're doing. We couldn't do it without you. We're not a multi-million dollar organization, which that we would, because we have tens of thousands of teenagers below the age of 18, between babies and 18, that we are actually helping every single day of the year, 24 seven, working with the social department. I'm one of the only Messianic Jewish believers that believes in Jesus that is permitted to any institution in the state of Israel. They heard my testimony, I sat with them. I have never compromised my faith in Yeshua, Jesus, my Messiah. I am who I am, but I love my people, and I will die for my people just as if when I was wounded in 1962, I would have died for my nation. I'm not only a patriot, I am a serious, committed man of God to Yeshua, my Messiah. In Israel, the Lord corrected me two days ago. We ate at a Lebanese Greek. We thought we were going to have Greek food. And, and I've been having a lot of problems with Muslims at gas stations, Muslims at hotels, every place I turn around. Islam is there. I mean, they're just, they just, they got everything. And I'm thinking, how in the world does this happen? And it, it disturbs me to go by Stuckey's on I-10 and all that and go in. And everybody's dressed in their the garb and, and, you know, all this. And I'm getting upset because I'm thinking about October 6th and I'm going to stomp them out, you know. And God said, you know, uh, I never called you to hate anyone. Come on. Amen. Amen. So, Amen. I pray for the salvation. Right. Hallelujah. I pray for the deception to be removed yes. in God's glory. Because if they get saved, they'll burn as I do. Right. Not only for Israel, but to the God Amen. That's what we need to do. We need to evangelize. We need to preach the word. When we go in and get coffee, we need to give a track. We need to tell them the story of Messiah. We don't need to back off. We don't need to let the world show us who we should be, not determine who I am. Nobody's going to mold me into who I am. He's already doing it. And I'm going to be shaped in the image of Messiah Yeshua. What he is, I want to be. What he does, I want to do. What he says, I want to say. How he looks, I want to look. Where he walks, I want to walk. Where he talks, I want to talk. Uh, and Matthew 10 is the call of God when I was called to ministry. He says, what I speak to you in the ear, that's what you say. I don't ever have to worry about what to say because he's talking to me and I'm listening because I'm his sheep and he's my shepherd and I follow him and no other. Amen. So that's our that's that's a good testimony, church. Thank Glory God. to God. That's who we are. Amen. Not just in here, out of here. Even with the guy that gives you a ticket along the highway, you just got to do some repentance, you know. I want you to turn to uh, Leviticus 23. I want to speak to you just for a little bit here uh, on biblical feasts. Uh, I've told Pastor that uh, biblical, the, the biblical feast of Leviticus 23, and by the way, um, I have a, a, a booklet and Pastor referenced it. Everything I have has got a QR code. Last time I was here, I didn't know what a QR code was. I was interviewed on the radio and all along the wall of this radio station, there was QR codes. I said, what is that? And he said, that's a QR code. I said, well, what does it do? He said, well, let me show you. And, and so I called my administrator and I said, we need a QR code. And they said, well, those things can be expensive. He said, not expensive. It didn't cost me but $25 to get my QR code. I said, get stickers, put them on everything we got. We got a QR 
QR code. I was so excited, I got one and laminated it and put it in a frame. So if you want to give and continue to give or give one time or give all the time, you got a QR code. And all you got to do is take your, your telephone and go click, and, and it, it lines you right up. But this booklet I wrote for, for Christians. I wrote this book and I've given Passover seders, they call them Passover meals, Passover seders. I've given, uh, I, I wrote this book for the church because it's real easy for you to do it. By the way, Passover belongs to you if you belong to God. The book of Leviticus 23 said, these are the Moedines of the Lord. Moedines is a feast. These are the things that God commanded Israel to do. During David's time, he didn't do Passover. He knew about Passover, but all the kings and all the, 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 uh, the, the, the judges, there was hundreds and hundreds of years that our people didn't keep Passover until a young guy, a young boy, about 12 years old, yeah. became a king. And, he, you know, we're rebuilding the temple, and somebody found a Torah scroll over in the corner, and he started reading it, and he turned Israel around. God's word will turn this nation around yeah. if you'll talk enough about it and preach enough about it and tell people about it. It's not just the pastor's job as all of us as believers, but this is a Passover Haggadah and it goes step by step. And I always tell people, there are four cups in this book. And if you can't afford it, listen, I want you to have it. I want you to have those prayer guides. You have to have them. I want you to see Jill's book on the divine woo, how, how the Lord spoke to her. She came to faith in the Messiah. She gave her heart to the Lord, and she's been serving God, on fire for God. We're both on fire and fire met in Florida, in Orlando. It just met in the hallway. And my, and listen, guys, this, I was real suave. You got this? First thing I said when they introduced her to me, I said, I'm 82 years old. And she said, I'm 78. <laughs> and she had her green eyes connected with my blue and that was it but this Passover Haggadah I wrote so that you could go through this in your home and at the end of it at the end of it you can do a Passover meal so uh, I want you to have that and all it is is the cost of the printing I'm not making I, I don't want to make anything I want, the, I want the body of Messiah to get a hold of this and this teaching today is about us as the body of Messiah it says in Leviticus, it says, Adonai spoke to Moses, and he said, These are the appointed Moedim of Adonai. Now, who do they belong to? In your translation of your Bible, it says, These are the peace of the Lord. Right? Look in your Bibles, on your phones, or whatever. Leviticus 23. What does it say? It says, These are the feasts of the Lord. Right? Yes. They don't belong to Israel. They were entrusted to us yes. to share who God is in the world. We were responsible. God chose us not because we were a great people. Look at Deuteronomy. Read through the Torah. Read through the, uh, the books of Moses. Read through there. God didn't choose us because we were just a great bunch of people. He chose us because we the least of people. He chose us because we weren't much good. and But yet we had a desire to know God. And because we had a desire to know God, God chose us. And we became a chosen people because God chose us. I wanted to be Italian. I didn't want to be Jewish and beat up every day and call the Christ killer. I had friends that were Italian. They were connected to the mob. I would have rather been an Italian or maybe a Cajun, maybe a French Cajun. I don't know. But I didn't want to be Jewish, but I grew up Jewish. It's like fiddle on the roof. Oh, God, why have you chosen us? Can't you just, like other Jewish people or something, God, can't you just share a little of this misery with other people? You know, can't we just get out? But we are the covenant people of God. Why are we the covenant people of God? Because we're so great. No, we're hard-headed, stiff-necked, hard-hearted, rebellious. I'm telling you, we're probably the most notorious rebellers of all the world. You think you've got rebellious kids? God's got them by the millions. Come on. And they're called Israelites. Because if you read through the scriptures, you find us rebelling. He'll, he'll heal us. He brings us back. We get this. We get that. And then here we go again. Right. Going out, chasing after other gods. Jill taught last night about Melech. God told us, he said, destroy these people. Destroy them off the face of the earth. This is back in the time of Moses. This is down the times of the battles. This is times of Joshua. You know what he did? They didn't get rid of them. 
They let the Philistines live. Here's Gaza. They let the Malachites live. Here's Hamas. Hezbollah. All the way throughout history because we didn't oh, destroy the enemy that God told us to destroy. Now listen to me, church. Listen to me, my Christian brothers and sisters. If there's things in your life that are ruling your life, you need to destroy them. You need to put them under that blood. You need to come to this altar. You need to repent and turn away from that, that God would heal you and save you and deliver you, yeah. not just for now, but from now on. Amen. You know? And so God gave us these feasts and vessels. Each one of them represents a miracle. Passover... Honestly, it's about the death of the firstborn, but you gotta remember all of the frogs, the lice, the flies, the darkness, these are all the gods of Egypt. Yes. And God wants to be God. Yes, right. He didn't shoot, he didn't die to leave me in charge. He's still God. Amen. He still rules. Yes, yes. He still has the same power in, as he had in creation and even before. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. He is God and God alone. I declare him Lord when I go outside of my house and I go running in the morning sometimes. I used to go every day until I got married. Now I'm using Jill as an excuse here. But, <laughs> but I mean, I look for just hover. But the thing about it is I go for a run. I'd be praying. I'd be crying out to God. I was crying out to God in my neighborhood. I was crying out. I had hits I was just crying out to God. And I'm saying, Lord, I just want to say your name. I want to say Yeshua. Jesus, I just want to say your name in my neighborhood. All of a sudden, there's lights flashing. <laughs> and two guys get out of the car, and I go walking up to them. They said, Sam, we are. And there are two policemen. And they said, sir, have you heard somebody screaming in the neighborhood? <laughs> I heard somebody was screaming in the neighborhood. I said, no, I haven't. I said, I had my headsets on. Maybe I didn't hear them. And then one of the album detectives pulled up behind him and told him, he said, leave him alone. That's Rabbi Ron. He's just out here praising God. You know? Hallelujah. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I said, guys, put me in cuffs. What do you get a picture of? I don't want to be arrested for praising Jesus. Yes. <laughs> and they said, go on, Rabbi, get out of here. You know. And I'm just telling you, I just want to declare the name of the Lord yes. right here. Lord, you are King of kings and Lord of all. Every place I put my feet yes, and sold my yes, feet, yes. I want it to be said, this is God's place. Yes. These are God's men. Jill and I are God's. The feasts and festivals, the word of God is for God's people. Pastor knows more about some of this stuff than I. He knew about why the... Uh, uh, Pharaoh's daughter, I believe the same thing for decades, but I think I got hoodwinked by one of my Mishnah friends. I don't know. Why is it that when the Pharaoh's daughter looked inside the basket and said, this is a Hebrew? Come on. We found out yesterday when we got back, we got to talking to some rabbis and some Jewish rabbis, Orthodox, and they said, it's because he was a living and he'd already been circumcised on the eighth day yes. when he was a child. Yeah. And he was months old. And I always believed that anyway, but I don't know how I got sidetracked. See, what I'm telling you, you gotta watch who's teaching you. Come on. Yes. You gotta watch who's teaching yes. you, you gotta watch who you're following, you gotta be careful not to get enamored. Be careful. Yes. Even in Messianic Judaism, you start studying these feasts and festivals, you have everything that you can imagine from strange things. There's your man. Stand up, brother. Here's a man right here. This is who God called you to be as a shepherd. He's called you to be a teacher. He's called you to be that man of God and to study these things and to be able to deliver them to your congregation so you don't go weird on us, okay? So you don't go weird on us. Please don't go weird on us. Listen, I don't want to become so Jewish that I forget Jesus. And you can do it. You say, well, I'll never do that. I've seen strong people that have been in the faith for 20-some years deny Yeshua and convert to Orthodox Judaism because they found the feasts and festivals in the Bible and nobody was teaching it and nobody was observing it. Observe them. Do them. The first one out of the shoot is Shabbat. When you look at Shabbat, Shabbat's Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown. Well, how did the church ever get on Sunday morning? Who were the first worshipers on Sunday? The first worshipers on Sunday were the disciples right. of Yeshua. But they didn't do away with Shabbat. Right. Because when you read the scriptures from all the way from Yeshua, all the way to the book of Revelation, all the way through every Shabbat, you found them at the synagogue. Paul went to the synagogue. 
Paul taught in the synagogue. All these things. Now you evaluate that. I'm not going any further with that because I believe the Lord's going to straighten it all out before he returns. And it, it, Constantine and all these other people that change the date and all this other stuff, God's going to straighten. He has already begun to do it. God's getting his bride ready. Yes. He's getting us ready. And he's making some desires in our heart. We didn't have any idea what it was. All of a sudden we read the word and said, what is that? The second thing we look at is Passover. Passover. And we go to Passover. I want you to see the timeline here. I don't believe in circles of end times. I believe it's a flat line. Now I believe the earth is round. Because <laughs> there's some new people coming along saying it's flat. I mean, hello? We've been on the moon. They said, no, that was a hoax. They just put that on. No, we've been to the moon. And you look down and earth is a round ball. But there's flatline Christians, you know. They're flatlined, all right. But the thing about it is, we got, God wants us to be, I want you to see this. Leviticus 23, write notes, think about this. And pastor, think about this. It's a timeline when Jesus, Yeshua, was killed at Passover. And then he was buried at the time of Passover. And he rose again after the first Shabbat, after Passover. And then he began to count 50 days. We are now in 50 days of Omer, counting the Omer. For 50 days, for 40 days, Jesus appears on earth. And he meets with all kinds of people, you know, and everybody knows that Jesus rose from the dead. They met him, they saw him, they believed him. Many would have crucified him again, just like Lazarus, they wanted to kill him after he got raised from the dead. But the thing about it is, they couldn't hush him, they'll never hush him. He ascended and he said, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. Go to Jerusalem and wait there. Wait there for the outpouring of the Spirit. On 10 days later, you ask a question to a lot of Christians, they say, how long did the disciples wait in Jerusalem before the outpouring of the Spirit? And they'll say 40 days. It wasn't 40 days. 40 days Yeshua showed himself on the earth. On the 10 days later, the outpouring of the Spirit. Now I'll show you something. And just, I got to study and uh, Jill and I were looking and I was looking through one of my Tree of Life, not Tree of Life Bible, but one of the application, uh, and they changed the date on Passover. I mean, on, on uh, First Fruit. First Fruit begins the day Yeshua rose from the grave. Paul writes this, he is our first fruit. Yes. Don't let anybody change that on you. Orthodox Judaism has us celebrating Pentecost on a Wednesday. Pentecost can never fall on a Wednesday. Because you take seven times seven is 49 and the 50th day is Sunday. Pentecost has to fall on Sunday. Now here's the thing that you might not know. On the same day that we have shovel rope, Pentecost, it's the same day that God gave the Torah in Sinai. The very same day God gave the Torah, the law to Israel. Hundreds of years later, here we are in the upper room, same day. You see, God said in the Torah, think about this, three times a year, every male shall appear in Jerusalem. This is one of them. It was unleavened, it was Shavuot, and it was tabernacle. Mm. So I want you to get a picture of this. It's a timeline of the death of Yeshua. By the way, Happy New Year. <laughs> Leviticus 23 said this month is the beginning of month. That's right. This is the first day of the month. Not January 1st, not Rosh Hashanah, not Yom Terah. This is God's first. Why is it the first? Because it's the beginning of the timeline, counting down to the time of the return of Messiah. Look at this. There's the outpouring of the Spirit in Leviticus 23. And then after you count the 50 days and you have the outpouring of the Spirit, there's a long time 
in between. That's the time we're in right now. It's a time of being filled and empowered by the Spirit of God. We're planting and sowing and reaping and harvest. We're doing His works as we travel along. And as, as, as the outpouring of the Spirit is, and, and we're walking in the Spirit and we're trudging along, and then comes the month of Elul, E-L-U-L, -L, Elul. Elul, that month, is a time of 40 days before the blowing of the shofar, the sounding of the trumpet, the blast of the horns. That's what it says in Leviticus 23. Are you following me? We have Passover. We have the death of the lamb. We, and I love the illustration that pastor used about the blood on the door frames. I use it kind of like this, and you're welcome to use this in your homes or whatever. Uh, at Passover time, I tell everybody, just take a picture of this. This is a doorway. This is outside. And by the way, nobody was inside that house. When the hyssops were being put on, the blood was being, and I got you got to see this. Papa's going out here, putting the blood, taking the blood. But where did the blood come from? They chose a lamb. Come on. They chose a lamb. Have you chosen the lamb? Mm -hmm. They put their hands on it. This is their responsibility. Each of us stand before God, young, old, male, female, whoever it is. Each one of us stand before God on our own. Nobody will stand with us. Our school teachers, our coaches, our pastors, no one. We will stand before God ourselves. And as we stand before God ourselves, there's one seated at the right hand of God. And he steps up and said, I die for him. What is this? Thing? Look, they take the blood and they put it on the door frames. And the blood is running down the street in some places. And it's, it's all... But then what happens? I want you to see this. They take and they step through the blood. Mm. Yes. Praise God. Death angel comes. Judgment comes. White throne judgment comes. All this comes. Yeah. I die. I stand before God, but I'm under the blood. Yes. Amen. I've gone through the door. Yes. You need to go through the door. Hallelujah. You stand outside, it's like with a dirty car and a car wash. Everybody's running their car out, and it's nice and shiny and clean. Yours is full of mud. But you're sitting there looking at this silly car wash, wondering, I've got a dirty car, I just got a dirty life, whatever. But I'm not going through that car wash. I can guarantee you one thing, somehow, it's, I, I, I'm not going through that car wash. You'll drive away with a dirty truck. And I'm telling you today, if you don't go through the blood, if you don't go through the blood, you're going to drive away with a dirty life. Yes. He'll clean you by the blood. Amen. There's Hallelujah. nothing in, I tell everybody when I do Passover saviors, uh, I said the Jewish, there, here's another Jewish anthem. And they said, what's that? I said, the Jewish people, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. It had to be a Jewish song. I don't know who wrote it. I probably better find out and give him credit for it, right? But the thing about it is we pass through the blood. Now, we're in this harvest time, month of Elul. Month of Elul means I'm looking at Ron Aronson. I'm not looking at Jill. I'm not looking at the church down the road. I'm not looking at false prophets and false teachers. I'd be called false teacher to Israel. There's a lot of false teachers. You could probably be a, uh, called a false because you're teaching something that somebody else doesn't agree with. But there are false prophets. There are false teachers. But during this time, we're looking at ourselves and God saying to us, you know what, Ron? I don't like that. I don't like that. And I'm weeping before God and I said, I don't, I, I don't understand. Well, how can I get rid of that? You don't like that. And, and so on. And during the month of Elul, 40 days before the sounding of the shofar, and I get this, we're longing to hear the sound of the shofar. Rosh Hashanah is coming. Now this is, I want to tell you something, you that are studying the Feast and Festivals, don't wait until this fall and say, well, we've got to wait until October the 5th or November the 2nd or whatever day, because that's Rosh Hashanah and you, you, Jesus can't come until that sound, listen to me, when, when, when the Lord comes, that'll be Rosh Hashanah. I don't care if it's in April, May, June, July, August, right. Right. it doesn't matter to me. When, he, when, he, when that shofar sounds, that's it. Amen. And we pray every day in Jewish life, 
Sound upon the great shofar. Redeem your people. Gather your outcasts of Israel. Gather us in, O oh Lord. Sound the shofar. Sound the great shofar. It's prayed in every synagogue every day, three, sometimes two and three times a day in the Amidah and the Shmon Israel prayers. The 18 principles, 19 principles of prayer every day we pray. Lord, return our judges as the days of old. We're not asking God for money. We're not asking, we're asking God to please redeem us. Please help us. And part of that prayer, and it's in Jeremiah and some of the, the prophets, it says, heal us and we shall be healed. Save us and we shall be saved. For you're the Lord, our healer. You're the Lord who saves. But part of our cry as Israeli people is, oh God, sound upon the great shofar. Without realizing in Thessalonians and Paul's writing to us in the book of Revelations and all the, the, that there is going to be a blast of the shofar. And we're in a time proceeding to the shofar. True story about a, a school for needy children, special needs children. They had trouble keeping the windows clean on the east side of the building. They just couldn't figure out why are these children's faces and handprints on the windows? It's on the east side of the building. And it was just special needs children. They said one day a man came by and they talked about Jesus' return. And he's going to come from the eastern sky and he's going to return. And those little children go every day to the windows. And as the sun's coming on the windows, they had their faces and hands toward the windows, expecting the Lord to return right then. What is your expectancy? How is it with you? How is it with you? Are you looking for his return? Are you waiting and longing for his return? Are you really crying out, oh God, change my heart, oh Lord? Are you, are you really anticipating his return? Because it says it's going to come suddenly. Yes. Without it's been, you're not even going to know it's going to happen. Yeshua said to his disciples, he said, Lord, when will these things happen? When is this time going to be? And, and in Matthew 24, Yeshua said, don't worry about the time. Don't worry about this. Just don't be deceived. Yes, yes. The main thing out of our Lord's mouth was, don't be deceived. Yes. Deception is everywhere. Discouragement, depression, loneliness, discouragement, all these things can cause deception. Yes. Be not deceived. And that's what I'm saying. I give you these things. These are our feasts. These are our festivals. Church, they belong to us together. I do Passover Seders. Did one, we were in one in Washington, D.C., uh, First night of Passover, second night, I can't remember which. And we did one in a church in, in Allen. We did one in a church in, in uh, Missouri City. And, and I had invitations in different places. And, and you can do a community Passover. You can get all the churches together. You can get all your friends together and say, hey, you know what? Next Passover, we're going to get together. We're going to get all this together. We'll call Brother Ron and see if he's got a, an opportunity or date to come and do a massive Passover among the believers in this area. We can do it. Yes. We can celebrate it. Yes. It's meaningful yes. because it talks about our deliverance. Yes. I believe during Passover that we should share our testimony with every kid at that table. How I came to faith in Jesus. Amen. I gave my heart to the Lord. How I came to the Lord. How did Jill come to the Lord? Telling our kids and our grandkids because you see it's door to door, generation to generation. And then we find in Leviticus 23, there's another thing that happens after the sounding of the trumpet. It's called Yom Kippur, the time of judgment. In Jewish life, between the sounding of the trumpet and Yom Kippur, the days of all, they give all kinds of money to all kinds of uh, organizations. They're, uh, they're, they're, I mean, it's a good time to hit up a Jewish organization and get money and funds for a building or whatever because they believe that as they give, that it's part of their atonement and God will write their name. Listen to this. Every year, my people, every year at that time of the year, they believe if they do write, you know, it's naughty and nice, if they do write, that God will write for good the next year for them. If they don't pass, they're not going to have a good year. And so they give everything. They do everything. And that's the idea of working your own salvation, working for your own 
pathway, doing the great things. That's why there's so many of our people are, are numbered among all the Guinness Book of Records and all these other things. That's why we build colleges and build schools and we take care of hospitals and some of our names are on hospitals and we do all these other things. And Mount Sinai and all this is because we're working our own salvation because there's no more sacrifice. There's no more temple. We can't atone. We can't have a high priest. We can't have a Kohen. We can't do these things so we're going to work on them. Isn't that how some of us are sometimes when we say, you know, I'd get born again, but I just ain't good enough. Mm. How many of us have been there? Yes, yes. God, I'm not good enough. I want to be saved, but I'm not good enough. Let me tell you something. You will never be good enough. Amen. That's right. Never be good enough. But he'll save you from where you are. That's right. A few weeks ago, Jill and I were in Galveston had to send off some papers and went by Kenko's or something we make some copies and there was a, a derelict on the street out there and he was around the car. I said, Dill, leave him alone. I know who he is, just leave him alone. I said, don't talk to him, just leave him alone. And he's out there and he's looking for a cigarette butt or maybe some marijuana or somebody who might have dropped a pill or something. And I mean, he was just in, in, in a bad way and, and uh, he was dirty and and I knew who he was, because I'd bought him hamburgers before, and I'd been down to Galveston speaking, and I just, I knew, I knew who he was. I don't, and, and I said, just leave him alone, let's get our stuff done, and let's leave. Well, that's not how it goes. I'm walking up toward Kenko, I'm walking up to get these papers done, and God strikes my heart. I said, okay. And I didn't have much money in my wallet, so, and I always carry money in my wallet so I can give it away. I like credit cards because I get points. I got Southwest for flights. We got a Hilton for, I mean, hey, we use credit cards to get points so we get something free. We use money to just give away. And I, that day, this man, we just say Bill. Bill was there and his hands were all dirty, his bicycle was messed up. He was working on it. And I get Jill and I always open her door. Man, you always should open the door for your wife. You get Jill in, I'm walking around. I said, okay, Lord. And he's over there in the corner. I said, okay, Lord, I get my wallet out, I got some money. I walk up and I said, hey, Bill, how are you doing? He recognized me. He hadn't seen me in a long time, but he recognized me. He said, you're Pastor Mike's friend. You're that Jew. <laughs> I said, yeah. And I said, here, Bill. And I gave him this money, put it in his hand. He said, oh, don't touch me. He said, I'm dirty. And I said, you know, Bill, I'm the same as you on the inside. No, no, you. I said, no. Where you are, I was. And Jesus took me from where you are. Hallelujah. I am. Hallelujah. And I said, Bill, he wants to take you from where you are. And he stunk. He was dirty. I just reached up, stand up from there, bro. I just reached up and took his hand and I drew him to me. And whatever he had on him, I got on me. I didn't care. He said, I'm so dirty. I said, no, you're not that dirty. You're not that dirty. I don't know. He said, I'm trying. He said, I'm really working hard. Pastor Mike's helping me. I said, you know, I hope one day you just let loose and let God, because you can't do it without me. Get some covering, get some mentoring. Oh, they don't like me in the church. I smell bad, and he lives in the streets. He's there like in Galveston, Texas. Hangs around where the water burger is off of 61st Street. I know right where he is. Haven't we been there? But the sounding of the shofar, the time of judgment. And then, it says the atonement is made. 
The next feast and festival that we go to is seven days of Sukkot. That's camp out. That's living in booths. I double dog dare you to go ahead and make you a sukkah. Look it up. Live outside in it seven days. I believe Pioneer Camping at 80, almost 83 years old is the Holiday Inn in a branch on the land. <laughs> but I do observe seven days. We go out to campsites at Congregation Belt and South. There's hundreds of us with camps, with tents, with rain comes, winds come. It's a temporary dwelling and it's seven days that we're camped out together and how we're hanging out together. I got, you know, I just want to insert something here. Our people wandered in the wilderness 40 years and we lived in sukkahs. We lived in temporary dwellings. But did you know something? I can't find anywhere in the world where it says, in, anywhere in the world where it says they got all blown away. It was like God kept us. Our sandals didn't wear out. Nothing wore out. Our sukkahs didn't fall down and by the way the temple was never the, the tabernacle was never blown away they just kept changing things as it wore out but it was there amazing but after that there's an eighth day a special day look in Leviticus 23 and you'll find it there after the after the, the sukkah there's the eighth day when there's a feast each one of these begins with a holy convocation a gathering and they end with a gathering Passover all of them, all the way through. And by the way, the, 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 the eclipse that we saw just a few weeks ago, that was the last day of the year of the God's biblical calendar. The next day was New Moon. And you know, if you go through the feasts and festivals, if you just go outside and look, there's a full moon. Full moon. Can you imagine all the people in the desert fleeing from Pharaoh? And there's a moon so big. Yeah, there was a, there, there was a cloud and the and the pillar of you know, fire, but there was a full moon. It impressed me and impregnated my heart toward God when I see this moon on all of our feasts and festivals. God kind of put an, an emphasis on I'm with you. I'm with you. There might be shadows and there may be fog, but I'm with you. There could be wind and there could be storms, but I'm with you. And there's coming a time in the Passover Seder, you heard me talk about the four cups. The third cup is where the church gets communion. You need to get that book where they have communion together. That's where the church, that's where we got the table of the Lord. As often as you drink this bread, uh, drink this cup and eat this bread, you do show forth the Lord's coming. It's in the, it's in the Passover. But the fourth cup is the cup of praise. But I'm going to tell you something. If you don't participate of the third cup fully, you'll never celebrate the fourth cup in that feast on the eighth day. I shared with you my heart about Leviticus 23. And these are the feasts and festivals. I'm going to let you Bible students and you guys go back and study this and read through it. It's a good day, a nice day. It's a Sunday. Maybe you'll just go and read through Leviticus 23. And you'll remember some of the words that I said. But you've got to remember one thing about what I said. These are the feasts of the Lord. They're the Moedims. These are the commandments. You shall observe these things, you and your children and your children's children, for generation after generation after generation. God always wants to remind us of the things he has done for us along the way. We forget so easy the day we were saved. We forget so easy, easy the moment that we were at the altar and God healed us. We forget sometimes so easy. Israel, my people, I do it just like all of us do. We forget so easy when things are tough. But we remember these more deeds because these are the things that God interrupted human lives. And he's still doing the same today. And he wants to interrupt your life today. He wants to interrupt you in such a way and to show you his love. Joe mentioned to me earlier that there are people here that are lonely. One of the biggest diseases, biggest illnesses in society today is loneliness. 
is loneliness. I know what it was to lose somebody that I love for 61 years and went over, over a year before I met you, alone in my home, in the house, in the chair, alone. That's wonderful. I got six great grandkids. I got two great, wonderful grandsons. I got two wonderful daughters. But it didn't heal it. It didn't help it. I go away. I drove 40,000 miles after I left here last year. From January the 3rd or 4th, all the way up to in July, I was on the road running and traveling, ministering and preaching, trying to fill my loneliness. Only he can heal. Mm. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Joan, Jill and I were crying out to God. We didn't just pray. We cried out to God. We didn't want what God didn't want. We only wanted what God wanted, and God put us together. And that's what we wanted, and that's where we are. But I want to pray for people today. I know that the Lord's Spirit is in this place. I know that there's a move that's going on in many of your hearts. And Jill and I, we just want to declare over your life today. He was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement of your peace was upon him. And by his stripes, you are healed. At the desk today, at the Holiday Inn, I was on my way out. And I always ask for a hallelujah everywhere I go, okay. even at your CC's. I didn't know CC's were community coffee. I happen to have an addiction of community coffee. I have beans. I grind them every morning. The only time I don't fast, the only thing I don't fast is coffee because I don't want the headache. I like my community coffee. And I get it on Southwest and I always order at least two cups if I have an hour in the air. But you know, as I was leaving, she said, man, you touched my heart. And I said, to God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things I just want to brag on him. I want to brag on him. With his blood, he has saved me. With his power, he has saved me. To God be the glory for the things. you today and I want to say this as a Cohen I can't remember the number of years ago I was in Jerusalem on my birthday my birthday is May 23rd 1941 but I was there in Jerusalem and I was in a synagogue in Jerusalem and it wasn't a messianic synagogue it wasn't a uh, they didn't believe in Jesus but I was there and could understand about half of what they said, but I got the gist of it because it was all in Hebrew. I don't speak Hebrew, read Hebrew, talk Hebrew, uh, but I are one. But uh, the thing about it is, when when the rabbi, the, the head of the, the synagogue, I was sitting in the back and I was just taking in, just being with my people on my birthday in Jerusalem, they called for a Kohen. <coughs> and almost everybody in the place turned around and looked at me. 
how they do. I have no idea. And he said, you're Cohen. And I said, yes. He said, come do the blessing over the people. And I was stunned in a way, but honored because it's my responsibility as a Cohen to bless, to do this blessing wherever I go. I've done it over bricklayers and cement truck drivers. I've done it over speedways and NASCAR drivers. It doesn't matter because God said, this I've entrusted to you as a coin. So today, I want to do it over you. Yes, and all of you, all of you, all of you. Yibreka ka Adonai vayishmere. Panavalaka Vikune Isadunai Panavalaka Vea Simlecha Shalom. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. Be gracious. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And thus you have put my name upon them. Abba, to thine be the glory, the honor, and the praise. If there is any recognition at all, it's all to the cross of Yeshua. It's all to the crown of the King of glory. It is all to you now and forever. Bless this house and this people. Make a powerful, powerful impact for this hour, for such a time as this. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen. God bless you.